Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. See, most everyone's at Beach Church, but we're here. Because we don't want sand or things like that. <laughs> so and we're here to worship God. Before we begin with today's sermon, which is titled, by the way, The Strangeness of God. And I see Joyce, you, can you hear okay? Okay. Um, so it's titled The Strangeness of God, and we're going to see exactly what that entails in the sermon. But first of all, let's bow our heads and pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you. Spiritual things are discerned spiritually, Lord, and we look to you for the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, that we may have wisdom and knowledge, Lord, that we might have discernment to know right from wrong, truth from error, and, Lord, that we might apply what we learn in our lives, that we may grow closer to you, that, Lord, by beholding you, we may be transformed into the image we were created in. We thank you, Lord, and praise your glorious name, our Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen, Lord. Okay, so the strangeness of God. The definition of strange according to Oxford Languages Dictionary, is unusual or surprising in a way that is unsettling or hard to understand. We're going to focus on the hard to understand part today because sometimes what God does is kind of beyond our understanding in our world. So let's, let's look and see how this is. First of all, we have to look at us. As we look at God, as we look at the things that he does, are there some things that confuse us or baffle us? Because of our condition, really, since the fall of Adam, we've been kind of stuck in this carnal flesh and this earthly as opposed to the things of God, which are spiritual and righteous. So from our worldview, we look at things completely different from the way God looks at it. And Paul reflects this best in Romans 7, 14 through 25, the conflict of two natures. But we're going to read Romans 7, 18 and 19. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For what good that I want... I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. Now, so now we realize our current condition. We realize things that even Paul battled with. And he's one of the champions of the New Testament. So we can't avoid this, right? But we're going to look and see how God's ways are strange or hard to understand as we read and so far from our natural thoughts, as we read John 3, 16 through 18. Should be up there, okay. For God, so, and everyone knows this first verse, right? Join in if you like. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then we normally stop, right? We're good. Let's just cut it off there. But verse 17 reads, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Folks, we're already condemned. God, it, it literally, that judged is past tense. And literally that was 2,000 years ago, past tense. But what does God have planned for us? Because it says that he's the only way that we can not be judged, right? What is his will for us? And we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men. Who's that? All men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So God didn't condemn us. We kind of condemned ourselves. 
And Romans, even to expand on this farther, Romans 8, 29 and 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. We see the path to salvation right there. And that one verse, so if God has called everyone, right, we might not pick up the phone, but he's called us. He's called all of us to be conformed to the image of his son, to be conformed to that image that we were created in before the fall. So you start off with the bad news and then we work to the good. (laughs) Jesus seeks to bring us all home to him and calls all of us from the vilest to the meekest. He seeks to transform into his image his perfection, his sinless state, even those who hate him. That's a hard one for me and how I look at things. And yet Christ, Christ is that epitome of, of righteousness, of God's character. So we've gone into some strangeness here, but why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus save everyone, even those that hate him? I got one word, love. I want to read Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man. That would be in our condition. Though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare to even, even to die that God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He gives everybody the opportunity. There's no partiality. There's no pre-screening, and none of that. So in our current condition, we look at things or we perceive things, we can see how anything that God does It's strange. It's hard to understand. It's hard to understand a love for that or love like that. But what he wants to do, he wants to bring us out of the world, out of the way that we think and we believe into something so much better. To alleviate, to to bypass that condemnation and leave it behind, as he promised, to leave behind any selfishness or the carnal flesh and mind that we have. John 17, verses 14 through 17, read, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth Your word is truth. So Christ is trying to, if we accept the offer, take us out of where we are and bring us into something so much better. I remember when I studied in Bible classes for baptism, you hear about a lot of things. You hear about the Sabbath. You hear about the state of the dead. You hear about how God died for all of us and now only a sacrifice of the living God, the creator, could atone for the penalty of death. And some of it was pretty hard to swallow. Some of it I thought, oh, man, what has my wife gotten me into? (laughs) Seriously. And But as you begin to study and read and see the promises of God, as that truth starts to seep into your life, you start to see that transformation from what, I was back then to what you become now. And I'm sure all of you have experienced this as well. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting here. So, and I'll tell you something. Even we have to make sure that this is always based on truth, though. And I say that truth is the foundation. Because 
if God was not consistent, the same yesterday, the same today, and the same tomorrow, right? If there was not that consistent truth, Christ wouldn't have had to die on the cross. God could have finagled some other way to atone for the sin and to change the law, right? But aren't you glad that God never changes? Aren't you glad that when he promises something, you know it's steadfast and true, that it's not going anywhere? He will honor it. So let's look at... Yep, let's... Let's look at the greatest commandment of all. Does anyone remember when, when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was? You shall love the Lord your God. I hear some people softly. With all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now let me ask you that word love there. Do you know what word that is in the Greek? So the, this one, technically, the form is agapeo. But you've heard of agape love, right? It's the same root. What is agape love? We hear about it. We hear it's the love that God has for us. We hear it's a selfless love, right? And really, that's about the closest word that we have in the Greek at that time to come close to it. But can that one word really describe the love that God has for us? Or is it just kind of a doorway for us to enter in? Remember, we're going to be studying this all through eternity and heaven, the love that God has for us and what he's done with it. So we look at the world, though. You meet people in the world, and not so much here, but they love things, right? They have a sports team that they love. They love their spouse. They love their children. Maybe they love food. But everyone has their own unique definition for love. It's kind of a, from my point of view. And I can attest to this. When I was younger, before I was STA, I had girlfriends ask me, do you love me? You know, that's a complicated question. Love can mean many things which means I'm trying to dodge a bullet, right? <laughs> but nonetheless, for people in this world, it can mean many things. Yet, the love that God has, that agape love, only has one definition. It never changes. You think of it, the closest thing we have on this earth to agape love, and are there any parents out there? Is when you have that first child. And the love that you have for that first child, well, and subsequent, subsequent children, but you get the first indication of how God loves us. And there's even biblical evidence for this. We see this, well, first of all, we see this when you're guiding them to keep them safe, secure, and cared for. You guide them on their path to adulthood. You try to teach them right, to teach them in the right ways, to guide them into a, a being good people, right? So, and if they stray from the path, what do you do? You have to correct them. And that's where we get that analogy from. And when they're younger, boy, they believe everything you tell them, don't they? Every last little thing, like it's the gospel truth. Because, have you ever heard the phrase, mother is God in a child's eyes? It's true. I had a buddy one time who told his daughter when she asked what a smokestack was in New Jersey, and he said, oh, that's a cloud maker. That poor child believed that smokestacks made clouds for years to come. But, so we want to look at an example in the Bible. We look at Enoch. So Enoch in Genesis 5, 21 and 22. Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah, and he had other sons and daughters. Now, the SDA Bible commentary on this um, states in volume 1, page 246, he, that's Enoch, belonged to the faithful race and doubtless had served God loyally during the first 65 years of his life. But with the arrival 
of a son to grace his home, he understood through experience the depth of a father's love and the confidence of a helpless baby as never before he was drawn to God, his own heavenly father, and eventually qualified for translation. We know that after 300 years, God took him, right? But we see that relationship, that how a parent with this child gives us that small taste of the love that God has for us. But now we want to take that understanding of God's love and, and bring it up to the next level. We read in Matthew 5, 46 and 47, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Boy, I, so we're going to see what it takes to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 13. If you get a chance, I would encourage you to read the entire chapter. We're going to read verses 4 through 13. And it is about love. And it is that agape love that God, truly only God has, or that comes through God. Love is patient. Love is kind and not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. And I love that part. I'm going to pause for a moment. This is actually reflecting to the second coming, when that perfect comes. In the world now, we see glimpses of God, right? We see through a mirror. How should, did Paul put it? Through a mirror that's dim, right? You have to remember a mirror back in those days wasn't like today. You took a piece of metal and you highly polished it. So it's kind of like looking at your reflection in a, like a stained glass refrigerator or something. That was, you see, dimly. But when God comes, you will see without any filters, you will see him as he is. And we won't perish because we'll be glorified. Verse 11, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now faith, hope, love, abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. And once again, it is that agape love. You need the faith to trust God. You need the hope for something better. But love is the vehicle that carries you. Love, that agape love, is a vehicle that will carry you to salvation, to heaven someday. Because we're going to break down some of these shortly and see what all these attributes mean and how they affect us in our lives. We will spend all eternity learning about God's love, that agape love. And like an onion, as you peel it layer after layer, it is a never-ending onion. Only God knows the depths of God. We can't possibly fathom it, but we can see parts of it. If we see parts of it in this world, we will see more in the next. So as we realize that we can't truly grasp that love that God has for us, angels seek to inquire into it. And in the plan of salvation, if they're confused, we're lost. <laughs> 
but yet the Holy Spirit reveals it to us, right? And bits here and there. God's love goes even beyond that. God's love can go to some interesting places. And now well, let's just dive in. Genesis 15, 16. Then in the fourth generation they will return, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. So we know this from Abraham, right? When God promises it to him. So the sin or the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. First of all, the Amorites in Canaan, they were the predominant tribe at the time or nation. So when it says Amorites, it's referring to Canaan in general. And God's love for all of his people, he desires to save them all, right? And he exhaustively tries everything he possibly can to save them all. And Canaan, there was once worshipers of the true God. Do you remember Melchizedek? This time, he was a high priest, right? Or he was a priest and a king of Salem. But by the time the Israelites come back, there's only one left, and his name is Balaam. And he isn't doing very well. Let's read the SDA Bible commentary on this verse. There is a fixed degree of iniquity beyond which nations may not go without incurring the judgments of God. The depth of depravity and moral degradation to which the peoples of Canaan had sunk by the time of Moses is revealed by their mythological literature recently discovered. They describe their gods as bloodthirsty and cruel beings, killing and deceiving each other, and immoral beyond imagination, as were the antediluvians, in other words, the pre-flood people. And, and the men of Sodom and the men of Canaan, like their gods, were controlled by the basest passions. We find them sacrificing their children, worshiping servants, and practicing immoral rituals in their temples. Their sanctuaries house professional prostitutes of both sexes. I'm glad the kids aren't here. So, by the time the Israelites returned, is there anyone in Canaan that is even worshiping God? No. And as we mentioned, there's Balaam, but he sold out for money. So, when God told the Israelites to kill all the inhabitants of the land, I have to throw it out. Is that an act of love or compassion? Is that, I know it's a hard one, but... Do you think God is putting them out of their misery? Or does he want them to live miserable lives and suffer the all, all time and then ultimately have a not so pleasant death more than likely? And we see that with the Canaanites because they were settled, they refused to change their ways. We see that with Sodom and Gomorrah. They couldn't even find anybody righteous in their outside of Lot. But I'm going to throw it out. Let's look at Nineveh with Jonah when God made the decree, right? And what did they do? Did they harden their hearts or did they repent? They repented. They changed their ways. And I've heard pastors talk about this before. I've, I've read it before actually um, in several other places. It seems like a cruel act from God, but actually it's an act of love. And I'm going to go ahead and use a, the, I know people, but if there's a racehorse and it breaks a leg, what do they do? Why? Because they're, they're prey animals and they're used to standing on their feet. It's impossible to fix them. So you could let the animal suffer and die, or you could be compassionate and put it out of its misery. And if somebody steps so far away from God, it's actually God having compassion on them, which comes from his love, to end that life. I know, that's the touchiest part of all this. But um, it seems hard to accept, but I'm so glad that God has not given us the wisdom to be fit to judge and that only he knows a person's heart and that he is the one that knows their motives and all these things. But let's go back to that parent example. So, when a child messes up, what do parents do? 
but it's time out nowadays, right? Or grounding or various things like that. What are they hoping to do with those children? Is that, are they just trying to be mean? Is it out of love? So they are trying to do what's best for their child. Does the child really know what's best for them? Not even close. And I've, I am not a parent, but I've spoken to many who are. Um, they tell me the worst part is when they become teenagers. And literally it breaks their heart when their child looks at them, when they do something for their own good, and their child looks at them and says, I hate you. I hate you, Mom. I wish you were, I won't say it, but you know what I'm saying. And yet, does the child know what they're doing? The parent still knows best. I kind of going to use the parallel with us. Sometimes do we know what we're doing? Or do we have to trust to God that he knows what's best? Even if I don't like it or I can't understand it, John tells us God is love. And as strange as it is sometimes, I just have to trust him and hold fast to him that he knows what he's doing and hold fast by faith. I want to read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Just that section. We're going to dig into this one. Okay, it's up. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. This is that agape love. And there are seven points in this scripture that show the excellent characteristics of love. And then we're going to have eight points of acts or attitudes that completely are foreign to God's love. They have no part in it at all. So let's start off with the good. Is patient. Love bears long with the faults, failings, and weaknesses of others, especially in an intolerant and impatient world. But yet look at how God deals with us. God's had patience with me since I was born. <laughs> I'm fairly certain. And I'm pretty sure he's had patience with us all. How many times does he teach me the same lesson over and over because I'm not the brightest bulb in the marquee? You know, I'm guessing some of us have that same experience. And yet God will, unless you grieve the Holy Spirit, God will never give up on you. And even then, we make the choice to push him so far away that he gives us that freedom of choice to reject him. Number two is kind. To be gentle, to exercise kindness, to be considerate and mild in all circumstances of life, especially the struggles and difficulties with others. Now, I know on number one with patience, I fail on a regular basis. For kindness especially in difficult times when somebody's pushing your buttons? How do we normally fare? Now, I see some heads shaking and some eyes rolling. <laughs> so, and, and I'm right there with you. Yet, God tells us that his love is all of these things. And it's so far away from where I am. And yet, if I just grab a hold of it, we can have this. Number three, rejoices with the truth. The opposite of iniquity, sin, basically, is iniquity. Love rejoices in virtue, righteousness, goodness, and the advancement of the truth. In other words, the advancement of us coming to God. Number four, bears all things. Love is quiet about the faults and weaknesses of others. I got to read that one again. 
Love is quiet about the faults and weaknesses of others, whether by ourselves or whether or we're with the group of people. How often do we do that? And and we'll get when we get to the end of this, I'll, I'll cover that more. But it believes. It believes all things. Number five, believing that a person has the best intentions or motives at heart. In other words, the opposite of evil surmising. Where you think somebody's up to no good, you're actually giving them the benefit of the doubt until you know beyond a shadow of a doubt. There's no way. So, number six, hopes all things. No matter how bad the situation may be with events or people, love hopes for the best. Even if just a sliver of hope exists, cling to that. Because God comes through in the end. And number seven, endures all things. Love suffers quietly all the difficulties, trials, persecutions, and injuries inflicted by man and the attacks that God allows from the enemy to launch against us because he allows it sometimes right we've read about this in crucibles and yet we are to quietly endure these things now those are the seven points in that scripture that come out for the characteristics the positive characteristics of of love how do we get that have you ever experienced part of them? Some here, some there? Maybe. So, unless you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, it's impossible for us to have this. We know our condition. We know how we are. Did Jesus have it? And he is our example, right? If he... If we were not able to have this very love and character, Christ would have never modeled it for us. Enoch had it. Moses, outside of here and there, had it. It's something within our grasp. Now we're going to look at the eight acts or attitudes that have nothing to do with love, with God's love. We're going to start off with number one, jealous and in the greek it says to be zealous for either in the greek literally good or evil but in this case it's used for evil to be zealous for evil with wrong or unpleasant feelings against those who have advantages over basically anyone who has something better than me oh no i can't have that bragging Love does not boast or brag or exalt itself. Love is humble by nature. Number three, arrogant. Literally, it means to puff up, to make yourself look bigger. Love does not inflate a person with vanity, does not produce a condition of conceit and self-exaltation. And we're going through these eight not so much to, we know these are things you shouldn't do, but we also know that if you see these characteristics in someone else, you know what's going on. So, number four, act unbecomingly. Love is never uncivil, rude, or ill-mannered. One must be mindful of the feelings of others and be courteous at all times. Number five, seeking its own. In other words, looking out for what is best for me. Selfishness. Many times we don't even realize it. It's so ingrained in us. But we must always put ourselves last. Number six, being provoked. Provoked to display annoyance, impatience, or anger. We need to turn everything over to God. Because if somebody's pushing our buttons, right, what does God say? He says, basically, give it to him. His burden is light, right? His yoke is easy. 
when we trade our yoke with His, we cast our burdens upon Him. Number seven, remembering wrongs suffered. In other words, you're holding a grudge against someone who did something to you. We never do that, I know. <laughs> I've been there. Rejoice, and then number eight, rejoice in unrighteousness. One finds no pleasure in unrighteousness, sin, in anyone, friend or foe. We should find no joy in an enemy battling with sin and losing. You ever had somebody who wasn't the nice per nicest person and something happened to them? You're like, eh, that's not so bad. And yet, that's not a characteristic of God's love. Now, we're reading all these because we're all at a certain place in our walk in Christianity, right? Ultimately, we want to be in these seven characteristics. Ultimately, we want that indwelling of God to reflect so deeply in us that we're truly reflecting the character of Christ. And that is really our goal because if we are reflecting the character of Christ, we can be the perfect co-laborers for him in this world. We can do his good pleasure. We understand his plan, or at least we can trust in it if we don't, we're not privy to all the information. And we can have that joy that Christ has, that God has, when people come to him. Have you ever felt that joy when you do something for God? And you feel the Holy Spirit come upon you? And you, for that moment, you feel the joy that God feels. It's better than anything this world offers. And finally, in verse 8, love never fails. It never, in the Greek, it's something that it never falls from its place. In other words, it stays mounted where it is. It's not shaken. It's steadfast and true. And no, how, no matter how hard it may seem or impossible it looks, in the end, love will prevail. And I say that because love is an attribute of God, of his very character. Have you ever know, have you noticed that all of those seven characteristics are all attributes of God? He's slow to anger. He's not quick to judge. He gives us the benefit of the doubt over and over again, even though he knows we might not have the best intentions in our mind. And so we look to this and we see how foreign these concepts are to us. And yet with God, this is who he is. Nobody loves like God does. And I actually want to read 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. Once again, that agape love. Because love covers a multitude of sins. God isn't so concerned with where you've been. God is concerned with where you're going with him. We could have done a lot of things in the past. But he wants to guide us in our future to be with him in this world now and with him later for all eternity. So let's actually read something here from, from Ellen White, The Sign of the Times. Because as we're developing and we look at the attributes of God's love through the Holy Spirit, we can have these things. We also need to take a look at not only the body of Christ around us, but the perishing world around us as well. And the White writes in Sign of the Times, January 24th, yep. um, severity to a few will often prove mercy to many. Yet we must be careful to manifest the spirit of Christ and not our own hasty, impetuous disposition. We must rebuke sin because we love God and love the souls for whom Christ died. So let me ask you this. If I see somebody I know and I see something that I'm not fit to judge, but I, let's just say I see something that's pretty clear they're having an issue with, do you talk to that person about it? Or do you leave them? 
if you love them, if you want to see them in heaven, perhaps it might be a good idea to say something. But unfortunately, most of the time when people say something, they bring a hammer. Have you ever been hammered by someone at church? And you know all that does is it makes my ears not work and it makes me want to distance myself. Those seven characteristics that we saw earlier. Did you see Jesus hammering anybody with sin? Outside of once or twice with the Pharisees, and I think he had to be that stern with them because their hearts were so hard. The woman caught in adultery. He writes the sins of all the people accusing her, right? And then he tells her to go and sin. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. He points it out, but he doesn't browbeat her now, does he? So there is a way, a very Christ-like way, that you can approach people to talk to them about this. Because quite honestly, if I had something that I didn't realize and somebody else realizes it, do you think I want them to tell me? I hope so. Because otherwise, I might be missing out on, on eternity for something that I had no idea about. So, as I said, there is a way to do it, and you have to follow those seven characteristics. Even if it's in church, if you see something that might not be quite right, should you say something? Once again, in a Christ-like way, if you love your brothers and sisters in Christ, one would think that we'd look out for them in a, in, in a healthy way. And as I said, most of the time that doesn't happen in a healthy way. But it should be in a healthy, Christ-like way. And even for the church. So... Let me ask you, we've read about this agape love, right? And it sounds really good. And we have part of it here and there. I'm sure we do. But how do you get more? I'm just going to throw out a couple of things. Do we start our day off with prayer? That we might, as Paul puts it, die to self and live in Christ Jesus. Number two, do we spend time reading his word? His word is food, right? Whether it's Sabbath school, devotionals, especially time in the Bible. Number three, before reading the Bible or your devotion or whatnot, are we praying for the presence of the Holy Spirit that we might have discernment, a spiritual discernment for spiritual matters? And that the Holy Spirit guides us to understand these things. Ellen White writes in Desire of Ages, page 83, this is number four, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones, especially that final week and the culminating with Calvary. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant. Our love will be quickened, that agape love, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. The love that Jesus had to bring him to the cross, that's the ultimate love that he has for us. That's the love that he wants to lead us to. And the Garden of Gethsemane, right? He had a choice. He asked the Father if this cup can pass from him. But if he would have done that, none of us would have ever had salvation. His love for us was the overwhelming factor. Do we have that love for others? And this isn't a, a check your thermometer. This is, I'm shooting for it. 
I, I do a lesson like this or a sermon, and, and it wakes me up to things that I'm missing in my life. I don't know which ones you may be missing. Maybe you're missing none. And if you're not missing any, then I'd say help somebody who is. So we read about agape love, and we're here at Laguna Niguel SDA Church, right? What's our motto here? Come on, somebody knows it. To know Jesus and to make him known. I want to begin wrapping this up with John 17, verses 13 through 21. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. We've read part of this before. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And Jesus continues in verse 18. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. I want to pause right there for a moment. Who is that? I heard somebody say it, us. We're sitting right here. You heard the word, right, that was preached. You came to know the truth. And you're here because you worship the living God. So, but I'm going to repeat that. But for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus is giving us an offer. He's saying, for you that learn of this down the road, you have the opportunity to abide with the Father and the Son. You have the ability, the choice to not only abide with them, to have literally part of the kingdom of God with you on earth, here and now. But he wants us to tell somebody about it as well. Whether that's at the grocery store, whether you go and hand out books, you know, that would be something. Do people know you're a Christian? Do you ever speak about God in your life to people? Are you more concerned about the well-being of others? Not just yourself or your immediate friends, but those unknowns. We see that somewhat with the homeless ministry, but remember the parable of the goats and the sheep. Are we longing to save souls in Christ Jesus from a perishing world, those that don't know the truth? Are we following the guidance of the Holy Spirit? Because he's really the one who's going to tell you what you're supposed to do. He's the one who has all the answers. He's God. And even when it's hard to understand, I've trusted God and done things before that, let's just say I paid the price for it. And in the end, I realized he was right. Sometimes it takes a little while to see the bigger picture, but we need to trust the Holy Spirit. And when it prompts us to act, when it prompts us to move for him, that we take that call. And basically, we need to be in his word daily, as we discussed before. Now we look at all this in the world. Does that seem strange? Does that seem odd? Are you a religious nutball? Oh, you're a Jesus freak. <laughs> or one of those things, right? 
But I'll tell you what, he has all the answers. Way before I came to God, I was drifting in the wind all kinds of different ways. I thought I knew what I was doing, only to later realize just how, as God, Jesus put it to Peter, how dull I truly was. God wants each one of us to grow in him. So if I had a prayer today, my prayer would be that each and every one of us here and those watching online would be filled to the maximum capable with the Holy Spirit and that each day we surrender somewhat of ourselves so that there's more of God and less of us. Because when there's enough of God, we will be that agape love. And when you are that agape love, you're ready for heaven. What better thing could there be? Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we thank you for counting us worthy when we never have been. We thank you, Lord, for redeeming us, for taking our place. Lord, for the choice that you made at Calvary, when the sin of the world came upon you, when you started sweating blood, Lord, when it literally almost killed you, and still you thought of us. Lord, we can never, ever repay you for what you've done. But Lord, guide us with your Holy Spirit and teach us to surrender to you that your ways, Lord, may become our ways, that your agape love may fill our hearts and our minds, Lord, and that we, by beholding you, may be transformed little by little. Lord, if we have any strongholds, help us to surrender them to you, that we might be without spot or stain. Lord, that we might be in the raiment fit for heaven. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father, Lord, but through Christ Jesus. Help us to make you the Lord of our lives. Every day, from the morning till the time we lay our heads, that, Lord, we might be the sons and daughters of the living God here and now. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for all you've done and all that we know you will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.